Three stars mysteriously vanished. So much JWST news, hundreds of volcanoes on Io, and Starship is ready to fly again. All this and more in this week's Space Bites. All right, look at this picture. Now, look at this one. We're just going to switch back and forth. Uh, do you see something disappear? Three stars right there in the middle of the image are gone. That's weird. So what you're looking at is two pictures that were taken 50 minutes apart in 1952 by the Palomar Observatory. And so astronomers were doing this all sky survey and taking image after image after image and then looking for things that had changed sort of like a rudimentary version of the Vera Rubin Observatory. And they found this grouping of three separate stars that were in one picture, and then they were gone. And they did follow on observations and they couldn't find even like faint versions of those stars. And now astronomers have taken one of the most powerful telescopes in modern times, and tried to find those stars. And no luck, they're gone. What happened? I mean, even if it was like a supernova or something like that, you would see a bright flash, there would be an after image, like there would be lots of debris, it would be obvious that something catastrophically happened. A single star, maybe there's like some kind of direct collapse into a black hole that could disappear one star, but three? That's weird. So one possibility is that you're looking at a magnetar that is being gravitationally lensed by a foreground object and the magnetar had a some kind of flash on its surface and this was caught in the gravitational lens, you saw three different versions of the same flash, and then it disappeared. And then the gravitational lens no longer lined up. And so the star effectively disappeared, and they couldn't find it anymore. That seems unlikely. Another possibility is that they're not stars at all, but they're actually some kind of object in the solar system, like maybe two objects in the Oort cloud collided, and you got this debris that brightened up briefly and then disappeared. But they would have to be very close to us. And they would have to be very close to each other. And that's a possibility. Or maybe they're just not an object at all. At the time, there were nuclear tests going on in the US relatively close to the Palomar Observatory. And so one possibility is that a piece of nuclear fallout fell onto the photographic plate that the astronomers were using, and you got this image, which then wasn't in the second image. So this isn't the first time that astronomers have seen stars disappear. It happens from time to time in old archival data. But this is like the first time we've seen three disappear all at the same time. So it's a mystery. There's no answer. Uh, if you've got ideas, put them in the comments. All right, I feel like I say this every week, but buckle up. Lots of James Webb news. So first, some follow on observations of the star Formahaut. And this is one of the most interesting, most fascinating stars that we know of. We've got these classic pictures that came from the Hubble Space Telescope. It looks like the eye of Sauron. And that's because you've got this newly forming star that's surrounded by some kind of planet forming disk. And it's relatively close to us. And so it's very large and bright and easy to see with lots of different instruments. But of course, this is the perfect target for James Webb. So astronomers did observations of this several months back, and they were able to get better resolution on the disk itself, able to see gaps in the disk. And they think that maybe they're seeing some kind of asteroid belt that was destroyed and you're getting sort of bright patches in the disk. But there was like a previous mystery that astronomers wanted to try and get to the bottom of that. And that is that there were 10 infrared objects embedded within the disk. And the question is like, what are these? Are these newly forming planets, brown dwarf companions around Formahaut? So the astronomers used James Webb, and they were able to look at all those objects. And they were able to see that in fact, nine of them are background objects, they have nothing to do with the star system itself. They're just faint infrared sources that are farther away in space, they could be galaxies, they could be other star systems. But one is part of the system. And so that could be like a brown dwarf companion or a large planet. And what's interesting about this is that they ruled out a lot of large planets forming around the stars, say things that are bigger than Jupiter, but that leaves things that are smaller than Jupiter. And so there could be a bunch of smaller planets, terrestrial planets forming in those various gaps in the disk, a new weather feature on Jupiter, 
When James Webb first came online, we got all of those first pictures. And then we also got an image of Jupiter. And this was like a really interesting technical challenge because Jupiter moves very quickly and rotates very quickly from the perspective for James Webb. And so astronomers weren't sure how well Webb was going to be able to examine Jupiter as an object here in the solar system. And it turned out it can do a great job, it can track the target, it can take quick enough images that it's able to resolve features on the surface of Jupiter without getting overexposed. And we got this really cool first infrared picture of Jupiter. But astronomers have been studying this picture and looking for anything that they weren't familiar with. And one thing that they found was a previously unknown weather feature on Jupiter. It's some kind of jet stream in the high altitude clouds on Jupiter. It stretches about 4800 kilometers long and it's got winds going about 515 kilometers per hour. And then astronomers did follow on observations with the Hubble Space Telescope and they were able to sort of see the same area and just like try to understand how do the various atmospheric levels on Jupiter interact with each other? How do you get the storm formation? How do these jet streams that move in different directions across the cloud tops of Jupiter? How do they interact with each other and create this really complex pattern that we see today? How do we get the great red spot? I mean, there's so many questions about Jupiter still. A detailed look at Ganymede. Now we actually got a picture of Ganymede several months ago from JWST. And I think we reported on it here in Space Bites. But the pictures weren't that great. It was a very quick observation of the moons of Jupiter. Astronomers got more time on the telescope and they were able to do much more detailed images of Ganymede with James Webb. And I've said this several times in the past that Ganymede is one of the most interesting places in the solar system. It is the biggest moon in the solar system. It's bigger than Mercury. It has like a solid core, it has a liquid ocean surrounded by icy shell, it has like a thin oxygen atmosphere, it has a global magnetosphere. There's so much that's interesting at Ganymede. And I'm like, I'm not the only one who thinks this, uh, the European Space Agency is sending its juice mission to the moons of Jupiter, it's going to be exploring Europa and Callisto, but mostly Ganymede. Ganymede is the new Europa. Ganymede is tidally locked to Jupiter. So one side is always sort of facing orbit, and the other side is trailing orbit. And astronomers wanted to know, is there any difference between the sides of Ganymede? And they found that indeed, around the poles, you get this sort of different amounts of chemical composition in the ice at Ganymede. A couple of really interesting chemicals that they found at Ganymede. One is carbon dioxide, which is not a chemical that you would expect to see above a shell of water ice. Like how do you get carbon dioxide out of water? And so what they think is that there was probably carbon dioxide mixed in at various layers through the water ice that is then being exposed to the surface and continually being replenished by micrometeorites wearing down the surface of Ganymede. They also found hydrogen peroxide, which is H2O2. And you know, if you get water and you hit it with a lot of radiation, solar radiation, you should be able to turn some of it into hydrogen peroxide. And so you've got this process happening on the surface of, of Ganymede. And so like the like the really interesting question about Ganymede is like, what is the interaction between the solid interior, the liquid ocean that is being enriched by chemicals, volcanism, things like that? And then is this enriched water? making its way to the surface and releasing chemicals out into space. And so more observations from Webb will help us get to the bottom of that. A debris disk around a white dwarf. So in the far future, our sun will run out of fuel in the core, expand as a red giant, and then blow out its outer layers and then shrink down to become a white dwarf star. And in this process, it's going to consume the inner planets. Mercury, Venus, they're goners. Earth, maybe, I mean, we don't know, astronomers argue about whether or not we're doomed or not, uh, but we'll be heated and so doomed on that front, but we may or may not actually go into the star as it expands, but then shrinks back down, becomes this white dwarf, and then will spend the rest of its days slowly cooling down to the background temperature of the universe. What happens to planets 
in this scenario? Can we get a sneak peek of what's going to happen to us? Well, maybe. Most white dwarfs are just these visible objects in space. They're just shining brightly with the leftover heat from the core. Because like a white dwarf is the exposed core of a star that is now just shining off into space. And then they will slowly cool down and eventually shift into infrared and eventually they'll be impossible to see compared to the background of the universe. But some white dwarfs have this infrared shell around them. And now astronomers know that these infrared sources are crushed up planets debris disks around these white dwarfs. And in 2018, astronomers found one which brightened briefly and they realized that this was probably due to asteroids comet smashing together, turning into more debris. So an infrared source, this is a classic target for James Webb. And so astronomers turned the telescope on this region, they were able to detect the presence of silica materials in the disk, sand, dirt, rock, like crunched up planets is which is what you'd expect. But they also were able to find carbonates, which are the kinds of chemicals that only form in the presence of liquid water. In other words, crunched up planets with liquid water made this debris disk. So I, I don't know, if, is this good news for our future or not? Every week we do a vote on our channel where you tell us what you thought was the best story. And last week it was all about Juno's flyby of Io. Great pictures. Uh, I totally agree. Very cool story. So thank you everybody who voted when you saw it come through your YouTube feed or in the community tab. Now if you want the best possible chance to find out more about these stories to do the vote, make sure you subscribe to our channel and then you can either just see it show up in your feed while you're scrolling on your phone, or you can go to the community tab and you'll get the new vote. So vote, tell us what you thought and we will celebrate it next week. Volcanoes across Io. Last week, we got the new pictures of Io taken by the Juno mission, it came within 12,000 kilometers of this moon. So this week, we've got some science updates on this, which is that obviously planetary scientists were hard at work studying these images. And we've got some initial data astronomers have counted up the number of volcanic hotspots across the surface of Io. And the current count is 266. There are 266 volcanoes on the surface of Io. And scientists think that these volcanoes are connected underneath by just a global magma ocean. So you've got like the inner part of Io, you've got this magma ocean that is within about 50 kilometers of the surface of Io. And then there's just hot spots popping up everywhere you've got volcanic activity that is blasting out onto the surface. And there's differences between the amount of volcanoes that are happening around the equator of Io versus the poles of Io. It's a very dynamic world, We're just getting these glimpses of you know the most volcanically active place in the solar system thanks to Juno. And like, we've got some pictures of Io thanks to the Voyagers, New Horizons took a picture of it. Galileo did one flyby of Io. But now Juno has done multiple flybys of Io. And it's due to do two more close ones, including in February, it's going to come within 1500 kilometers of Io. So 10 times closer than this last picture was. And so we're going to learn so much more about Io. Largest ever simulation in the universe. One of the ways that astronomers check their theories about the large scale structure of the universe cosmology is they build simulations of the universe, they put in all of the factors that they believe were the case in the universe, and then they evolve it over time to see whether the simulated universe matches the one that we have. And then from that, they can tell whether or not the various theories that they have properly predict the universe that we have. And so the largest universe simulation ever made just wrapped up. It's called Flamingo. And they used 10,000 CPUs in parallel to compute this simulation. So imagine you've got a block of simulated universe that is 9.1 billion light years on a side. And within that you've got about 300 billion objects which are like from dwarf galaxy to larger spiral galaxies that are interacting with each other throughout the entire evolution of the universe. You've got dark matter, dark energy, regular matter, they're accounting for neutrinos, as well as all of the energy that is going on from all of these objects and how they all interact. And they found that and it wasn't until they accounted for all of the stuff that we see in the universe and properly simulated in the simulation, did they actually get a very accurate, thorough measurement of the universe. 
And I wonder, like, are we getting to the point now where people inside this flamingo simulation are wondering if they're living in a simulated universe? No, sorry to break the news, but yes, you are living in a simulation. Space Bites is one of the kinds of content that we do. We do a lot of our question shows, but some of the work that I'm the most proud of are the interviews. We do now probably two interviews a week, deep dives with space scientists, astronauts, astronomers, engineers about the work that they're doing to push us forward into our understanding of the cosmos. And what's great is you as my audience, you're very technically knowledgeable. And so I don't have to pull any punches. I can ask really complicated questions, listen to very complicated answers and ask follow on questions. We can skip the basics and get right into the more advanced stuff. And I'm really glad that we're able to do this kind of content. This is the one that I'm learning from the most and hope you are too. So, you know, when you see the interviews come up, trust me, they're great. You'll enjoy them. Stick around or like sign up for the podcast and then you can listen to them at 50% higher speed and consume them because I think you'll learn a lot of new things with every one of the interviews. And of course, we've got a playlist of all of the interviews so you can just go through them one at a time for hundreds and hundreds of episodes if you want. Astronomers want hundreds of hours to study the Milky Way. The center of the Milky Way is one of the most interesting places, relatively nearby. It's only a few tens of thousands of light years away from us. This is the place where we've got the supermassive black hole at the heart of the Milky Way, a place where stars are thousands of times clustered more densely than what we've got in our neighborhood. There is the gas and dust left over from all of the stars. And some really weird things have been found at the center of the Milky Way that there is regions of star formation that really shouldn't happen in such a radiation pulverized part of the cosmos. And yet there are new stars forming just within a few light years of the supermassive black hole. That's weird. So astronomers have put together a gigantic proposal for hundreds of hours of time on the James Webb Space Telescope to try and reveal the center of the Milky Way in a way that we've never seen before. Because it's all shrouded in dust, this is the perfect place that you would search with James Webb. It's an infrared instrument. It looks through the dust. It can see through all this stuff and start to map out the region. So a gigantic proposal was sent out with 80 different scientific institutions participating, hundreds of astronomers making the case that they need hundreds of hours on James Webb to study this region and answer a lot of these outstanding questions about the center of the Milky Way. Starship is ready to fly. We got a really cool video from SpaceX showing off the SpaceX Starship Super Heavy stack doing a wet dress rehearsal. And this is where they completely tank up the cryogenic propellant into the spacecraft. And so according to SpaceX, Starship's ready to fly. But according to the government, Starship is still not ready to fly. And that was because back when they did their last test launch, there was a bunch of environmental issues. There's a giant checklist that the FAA gave to SpaceX to work through, solve all these problems and get themselves ready and compliant to be able to fly again. SpaceX says they've gone through the list. They've completed all of the tasks that were required by the FAA, and now they're ready to fly. And so now we're waiting for final approval from the FAA. When they get that, then they're cleared for launch, and we should see another test of Starship. And hopefully this time, it'll actually make it to orbit. Finally, another picture of Jupiter. This one came from Juno, and it was taken during the 54th flyby of Juno going past Jupiter. And it looks like this spooky, scary face on the surface of the planet. And NASA always gets into the Halloween spirit every year. They, they'll post a bunch of pictures that they think are Halloween related. I mean, like, I don't find, like I find space, the concept of an overwhelming infinite cosmos filled with an unknown amount of friendly or malevolent alien entities terrifying enough to sort of think about how we are tiny specks in this infinite cosmos, we are insignificant. And there could be an infinite amount of time ahead of us. And yet we're here for this brief moment. It's hard not to feel just this cosmic horror and uh, ennui. But here's a scary face in Jupiter. I'm going to talk about Io some more. 
But first, I'd like to thank our patrons. Thanks to David Richards, Mark Anstis, Antonio Lofilara, Dustin Cable, Vlad Shiplin, George, Andrew Gross, Jeremy Mattern, Josh Schultz, Jordan Young, who support us at the Master of the Universe level, and all of our supporters on Patreon. A couple of years ago, NASA put out a short list of the missions that they wanted to consider for the coming decade. They proposed two missions to Venus, one mission to Io, and one mission to Neptune's moon Triton. They had to shortlist that down to two missions, and they ended up going with the two Venus missions, which is fine. Like, that's great. Uh, I would love to know more about Venus, but that means we don't get to learn more about Triton and we don't get to learn more about Io. And when you look at these pictures of Io, you look at the and we understand the volcanism that's going on. Like imagine if you could be down on the surface of Io and just see volcanoes exploding in all directions out to the horizon with Jupiter super close. That would be amazing. And so it would be just fantastic to have a mission that's dedicated to Io that just keeps making flybys, passing through this punishing radiation field, taking a bunch of pictures, focusing in on individual volcanoes, seeing how the ejecta from the volcanoes is spreading around the entire world and falling back down in these curtains, creating volcanic craters, trying to understand the amount of heat that's being generated inside the world because of its tidal interactions with Jupiter. I have questions and I would love to have some answers. And so even though we don't get the IO mission, we got the two Venus missions, please put the IO mission back on the table. We need to learn more about IO. All right, we'll see you next week.